Hello, my name is Steve Brown, and I'm the worship leader at Vintage Faith Church. At Vintage Faith, we believe the Word of God is what changes and transforms a person. We hope you enjoy the next 30 to 40 minute sermon of the Word of God being proclaimed and explained. Enjoy the message. Well, good morning, church. <clears throat> a few announcements before we get into 1 Peter. Uh, June 5th, that is next Saturday, is our work day, 8 a.m. ish to 11. So we'd love to have you come out. We're going to do some things at, on the outside of the building, going to fix the screens, get rid of some stuff. So um, please, if, if you're interested, come out to that. We have a new box in the back for tithes and offerings. Um, we got rid of the cardboard uh, makeshift box. So, <laughs> right? We're moving on up. Um, you see it back there. It's got, uh, you know, an actual uh, top and a place where you can slip your, your check in. Uh, don't forget that we have GiveLify. So if you want to give electronically, um, find Vintage Faith Church Cicero on GiveLify. That is also an option. July 11th, after church, weather permitting, party, barbecue outside, hanging out. Um, so keep that date open on your calendar if you can. That's July 11th, and, and we're going to eat, fellowship, and just enjoy each other's company. It's been a long time since we've been able to do that. So looking forward to that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You're our Savior. You're our God. Lord, we often come to you with, with hearts that just don't give you the proper exaltation. Work in our hearts as a church this morning. We all are coming from different places with different problems, different anxieties, different trials. Lord, we ask that through your word that you center our hearts on you, who are our true hope. Lord, as we read your word together, show us where we have put our hope in things that will disappoint. Show us where we have worshipped your creation over you. Lord, guide us individually and guide us as a church. Unite us with a sweet spirit of fellowship. Pray this in your name. Amen. So, the First Peter is going to take a, a little turn today, and uh, I, I want to explain kind of the turn that it's taken before we get into it. It's, it's actually a turn that most of the letters, when you read the New Testament, will take this turn. If there are any English majors in here, you know the term, and, and I'm going to explain these, but indicative and imperative. Indicative in the Bible is these are the things that God has done for you, for me, for his children. They're, they're, they're usually verbs, indicative verbs. Imperative is go and do this. A command. Most of the letters in the New Testament are going to open up with indicative after indicative of this is what God has done for you. This is what God has done for you. This is how amazing God is. This is how all the blessings that you have in Christ. And then they always turn and they give the imperative. Be, because God has done this, now go and do this. And today we're in that transition. We've been talking for, for the last few weeks about what God has done and the, and the glory of what God has done. And today Peter takes that turn and he's going to say, because of this, now go and do this. But we always have to be careful as, as Christians because if we flip that around, we're going to get into a legal spirit 
legalism. If we go and do to earn God's favor, we have just distorted the gospel. We do because of what God has done for us. Karen Jobes, I've been quoting her throughout the sermon series. She has commentary on 1 Peter. She says this, the imperatives of Christian living always begin with therefore. Peter does not begin to exhort Christian pilgrims until he has celebrated the wonders of God, God's salvation in Jesus Christ. So I I would just press on you a little this morning. When you think about your life as a believer and, and, and you think about being obedient to God, is it rooted in everything that God has done for you? Is it a joyous obedience or is it begrudging white knuckle submission? And sometimes that line can get blended, and and we don't even know ourselves why we're doing things. All right. I'm going to tell a a, a little story here. Um, In 1996, if you guys can think back to 1996 for a moment, a good friend of mine and me decided, hey, we're going to, we're going to hike the Adirondacks. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to hit every peak in the Adirondacks, and um, I don't know if, how well you guys, how familiar you guys are with the Adirondacks, um, but Mount Marcy is the, the, the largest mountain in the Adirondacks, and we decided we're going to start there, right? If you're going to do it, do it big, right from the get-go. And this is 1996. Cell phones don't exist in the way that they exist now. I don't think either of us had a cell phone. Actually, I'm sure we didn't. We got our maps. We got our backpacks. We got our food. We said, okay, we're going to take a four-day trip, camp out along the trip, and and get to the peak of Mount Marcy. It was late spring. If you know that area, we went in through Adirondack Lodge, up through Marcy Dam. It's beautiful, beautiful country, majestic country. And it started raining, but not, not too much. We kept going, didn't have a weather app, you know, we, we had maybe checked the weather, maybe, I don't even remember, before we left, we probably didn't. And it continued to rain, and it continued to rain. We, when you're dealing with paper maps and rain, your maps all of a sudden can be very hard to read. And I think that happened at one point. This, it was raining. At this point, it started raining so hard that there were seemingly rivers that weren't on, the, weren't on the map, or maybe they were on the map and we didn't see them. So we, we find ourselves crossing decent-sized streams, and, and, and we finally get to, to this clearing and it was raining pretty hard, and we said, we, we need to set up our tent. This, this is, we, we can't go back to the car. It's going to be a four-hour, well, I mean, we could, but it would be a four-hour hike back. We need to find dry ground. We were looking around for, for dry ground. We tried to set up the tent, and actually, it was so soggy that the, the tent stakes wouldn't stay in, and the tent just kept coming up, and the wind was, was whipping. There was a... A, a, a stream that pretty much turned into a river. Visibility was maybe 15 feet foggy. We see what looks like dry ground on the other side of the river. We say that's where we're going to set up our tent. Our maps at this point are shot. My buddy was a little stockier than me, stronger, and, and, and you know, just as far as stockiness and weight, he crosses the stream. It's probably waist high on him, so it, and it's moving. He gets across. There's something in me that says, no way, this is not smart. This is not smart. So I start crossing. Not feeling good, all of a sudden my foot slips. I've got a 50-pound or more backpack on my back, 
and I'm floating down a river in the Adirondacks. Water kind of takes me to the other side. He grabs my hand, get out, start laughing nervously. <laughs> like, all right, dodge that bullet. Okay. Two minute hike down, down the trail, and I see something that literally took my breath away. Waterfalls. I was 30 feet from going over a falls. Indian Falls, if, you, if you've ever been to the Adirondacks, it's, it's not huge, but it's enough to, to kill someone or break a leg, break a bone, and be in some serious danger. I saw that falls, and immediately first, everything starts coming to your mind, like, I'm so careless. Why did we do this? I could have died. And you have all those thoughts, but those thoughts kind of dissipated and it, and it turned into a, a, just a soberness of thought that I couldn't shake for months. Me and my friend didn't even talk about it. Now think about this. I'm 21 years old. We didn't like laugh and say, hey, remember that time last month where we... Well, you almost went over the waterfall. Like, there was no talking about it. I couldn't tell my parents. My mom's not here today, so she doesn't get to, to hear this story. I, I, I may have told her this story. I don't know. The only way that I can describe the feeling that I had months after was sober. Everything in life that mattered mattered more. Everything in life that was kind of frivolous and I spent a lot of my time thinking about and, and, and you know, pushing towards a 21-year-old kid, it didn't matter. It didn't matter to me. I, I had and saw life through a different lens. And I would ask you this morning, and I ask myself this same question, why is it that some moments in our life can tend to sober us up. Not sober in the way that we usually were, use that word, like, hey, drunk and sober. This is not the way Peter's going to be using this word today. It's a sobering of thought. Why is it that a near-death experience or losing someone, why is it that these moments tend to really take us out of what we're thinking in, in all of our pursuits and all of our thoughts in sober us up. So I want that thought to be in the back of your mind today as we dig into the scriptures. All right, let's go. First Peter 1 Peter 1.13. Here's our, our therefore. Again, connecting back to everything that, that Peter's been saying about all the beautiful things that God has done in Christ for you. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's look at a few. Again, we're now into to commands. We haven't been here. Peter's turning this corner, and the first thing he's saying is prepare your minds for action. Actually, the the thought here is girding up the loins of your mind. Girding up the loins. So back in, in this day when men wore long kind of flowing robes, they would tuck their robe into their belt and just be ready. Be ready for battle. And that's the idea here that Peter is saying. Get your mind ready for battle. And how do we do that as, as Christians? How do we get our mind ready for battle. Well, well, the most obvious is God's word, right? We can, we can be thinking and having thoughts and living our, our life, and, and, but the word is always going to recenter us and it's going to get our mind thinking rightly. Prayer, of course, all the spiritual disciplines, being in the body, worshiping together, 
These are things that are going to gird up the loins of your mind. But I think it even goes beyond that. And I know in my life, to get really practical, sometimes what I eat affects how I think. Sometimes exercise can help and affect my mind. Certainly what I take in, movies, music, all of that has a way of affecting your mind. And what Peter is saying here, it's an all-encompassing, gird up the loins of your mind, prepare them for action. The same Greek word is used here in Luke 12, 35 to 36. Jesus is going to use it. Use it. He's going to say here, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. So this is the same idea. And Jesus said it, now Peter's saying it. Be ready, Christian believer. Be ready. The mind is something we need to steward and use. Peter goes on saying, set your hope or in, in being sober-minded. So here's the second imperative, the second command here that, that Peter is giving in this letter. Be sober-minded. So the idea behind the, the, the word here that he's using is to curb the controlling influence of inordinate emotions or desires to be restrained, not taken by every thought or emotion. It's the idea of living in proper relation to reality. This is what happened to me when, when I realized I could have died here. I could have went over those falls I was a 21-year-old kid who didn't ever think about death in that way. I thought I was invincible. But that moment sobered me up to a reality that my ridiculous, careless choices could actually kill me. That was the first time in my life I had ever had that thought. So this idea of being sober-minded is, is being in line with reality, not being taken by our emotions. Can we talk honestly for a moment about emotions? Emotions are intoxicating, aren't they? Like, think about this. When you feel anger and you're wronged, what do you want to do? You want to vent it. You want to act on it. Emotions are intoxicating. The more and more I walk with Christ and the more and more I study the Bible, I, I am increasingly becoming convinced that one of the primary functions of the Word of God is to help us not be overcome by emotions and swung around by our emotions, but actually transcend them and master them. So to be able to feel anger... That's all right. The Bible says be angry, but don't sin. You're going to feel emotions. The question is, are our emotions controlling us at a point where they're intoxicating and we have lost touch with reality? So Peter continues to go on. So he's saying, now prepare your minds. Be sober-minded. And then he has a third imperative here. He tells us to set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if you've, if you've noticed over the last few weeks, Peter is unequivocally, constantly telling us that the hope that we have is a future hope. It's in the future. You have it now, you taste it now, it, it affects you now, but it's coming. And here he's saying, focus fully your hope on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
what we hope in will control us. So again, he's talking here. Our emotions can control us and intoxicate us, and our hope can control us and intoxicate us. We have the the famous quote. I've read it multiple times, but it's David Foster Wallace. He's not a Christian, and he says this about hope and worship. He says, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there's no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worship, worshiping. Everybody worships. And what Foster Wallace is getting at is you will be controlled by something. That thing that you put your hope in, it's actually worship. You've elevated it above everything else. And whatever that thing is, is it beauty? Is it intellect? Is it affirmation from people? Do do you need to be liked? Whatever that thing is will control you. And Peter is saying here, don't set your hope on, on, on these things that you typically may set your hope on. Think about the grace that's going to be coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is our true hope. And that hope gives us joy now. Remember a few weeks back, Peter said, you are filled with a joy, an inexpressible joy from that hope. All right, Peter keeps going on again. Commands, he's given us imperative commands. Um, So this is different. This has a different flavor than where we've been the last four weeks. 1 Peter 1, 14 to, to 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So it's interesting to note here, um, you're going to see Peter do this throughout the letter. It's actually going to increase in intensity. He is going to use Old Testament language applying it to the Christian. And here he's quoting from Leviticus 19.2. So let's just go to Leviticus 19.2. Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So Peter's quoting here from, from the Old Testament law. And he's applying it to the Christian, he's applying it to you, he's applying it to me. And he's saying, God is holy, you are God's children, therefore you be holy. And I would ask this morning, when you think of that word holy, what comes to your mind? What do you think about when you think about the word holy? I know what immediately comes to my mind. It's usually priestly robes, incense, maybe even a chanting of of some sort, or the negative aspect, oh, you're holier than thou, right? that, That word gets used in a negative way, especially towards Christians. But holy in the Bible means set apart, Pure, devoted to God, different, not common. This is why when God saves Israel out of Egypt, he immediately gives them the law. Not because it's a, it's a burden. It's like, no, you're, you're my people. You're going to live differently. You're not going to live like the nations around you. And Peter's hearkening back there by quoting Leviticus, and he's applying this to Christians, saying, you are not going to live like everyone around you. Be different. Be set apart. We can talk for a minute about legalism, because many times holiness and legalism get kind of intertwined. Legalism is is real. It's a real thing. It's dangerous. Jesus rebukes it all throughout the the Gospels. 
It's sin. Many times our consciences, we kind of try to put them on other people and because we're convicted about something, and, and that can be a form of legalism. That's not what Peter's talking about here. Peter is calling us today, be different. He starts off in, in verse 14, he says, as obedient children, your children, your children of God live differently. Yes. Owen Strayan just recently tweeted this, and I don't know if it was him or someone else, but I've used this quote before. But he said, we've raised a whole generation of Christians who were taught to believe that the pursuit of holiness is legalism. Uh, just think about that for a minute. You may have had those thoughts. I've had those thoughts. Like, this is, we're being called by God to, to live different lives. That's not legalism. In fact, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, Cost of Discipleship, he talks about this. He says, cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. We are fighting today for costly grace. Grace is represented as the church's inexhaustible treasury from which she showers blessings with generous hands without asking questions or fixing limits. Grace without price, grace without cost. The essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in advance and because it has been paid, Everything can be had for nothing. He's basically saying the church in, it, in his day, which is a generation ago, you're treating grace not like grace. You're basically saying, hey, I can do anything I want because God is a God of grace, and that's not in the Bible. <laughs> yes, yes. You can come, come on up here and give you the mic. Yeah, that's, um, so Bonhoeffer is saying, listen, this is, cheap grace is the enemy of the church. And I, I would say it's the enemy of the church in, in America right now. There's just a large swath of thinking that just believes that because we've been forgiven in Jesus that we can live any way we want and that God's not calling us to, to be holy. And we're reading it right here. But he who called you is holy, you also be holy. It's the great call of the believer to be holy, to, to be different, to be set apart. So I, I would ask you this morning, what is the grace of God to you? What is it to you? Do you think of the grace of God as a pass to do whatever you would like? Or, rightly so, does the thought of the grace of God bring you to repentance and a greater love for God? There's a huge difference in that. One is... God's grace, I'll do anything I can, which Paul clearly, clearly rebukes in, in, in all his writing. And the other is, oh my gosh, God, you've, look what you've done for me. I want to obey you out of love and joy. They're hugely different. But we need an understanding of who we are. If we're going to be called to be holy, we need to understand that there's sin in us and we need to call sin, sin. R.C. Sproul in The Holiness of God says this, when we understand the character of God, when we grasp something of his holiness, then we begin to understand the radical character of our sin and hopelessness. Helpless sinners can survive only by grace. We may dislike giving our attention to God's wrath and justice, but until we incline ourselves to these aspects of God's nature, we will never appreciate what has been wrought for us by grace. What Sproul is saying here is why I talk about sin. Why, when, I, when you meet with me one-on-one, -on -one and I'm probably trying to bring you 
there to, to your sinfulness, not to, to beat you down and make you feel shame, but to see, okay, this is why he died for me, like that cross was for me. And to be washed and to live a joyful life. We will never appreciate cross of Christ until we realize the holiness of God and our own sin. And I know from talking to you, there's people in in, in various stages, there's very soft consciences who you you think about your sin all the time and you might beat yourself up about your sin. And and, and, and in some sense right now, I'm not talking to you. Um, And I know there's others that like, you know, you might think, hey, I don't, I'm, I don't sin. I don't know. I can't even think of anything that I've, that I've done. Right? There's, there's a spectrum. But the cross and the grace of God doesn't make sense if you don't put your sinfulness up against God's holiness. Okay, Peter continues here in, in verse 17. And this is just the, the flow of thought here. S- stick with me here because he's, he's really kind of pushing on the, this one thought, this entire pa- uh, passage that we look at today. And it, it's the idea of cheap grace. Don't take the blood of Christ cheaply. But here in, in 17, he says, And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, here's another Imperative, another command, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Conduct yourselves with fear. I don't think this verse makes sense to more than half of American Christians. I really don't. And I'm not saying that arrogantly. I just don't think that the church in America has a category for this kind of Obedience to Christ. John Piper says about that verse, when Peter says, conduct yourselves in fear, knowing that you were ransomed from bad conduct by the blood of Jesus, he means fear conducting yourself in a way that shows that the blood is not precious to you. God wants you to soar with assurance But don't ever twist that assurance into a justification for conduct that proves you don't think the blood is infinitely precious. Think about that for a moment. Have you ever considered your obedience to the word of God and your obedience to God when you're as as seeing the blood precious? Or have you ever considered your disobedience to the word when you know, I know what the word says, but I'm going to do this anyway, is a high hand to the blood that was spilled for you on the cross. Have you considered that? Peter is saying here in 17, if you call on him as father, and then he he describes the father who judges impartially. So this is a father who judges even in a sense to the Christian. He judges impartially. Good is good, bad is bad. He is not okay with us flippantly just walking in in sin and saying, I I don't care. I know the Bible says this, but I I don't care. I'm going to do what I want. There's consequence for that. He's a father. He judges impartially. Paul says he's a father, Abba. Father, like we come to him like a child can come sit on a father's lap who he knows he loves him. And that's so true of God. But he's also a father with authority. And in a sense, we should fear him. And you might be thinking, well, I don't, I've heard this. I, I'm not going to worship a God that I fear. I, I have, there's no place of fear in my worship of my God. 
But this is not that type of fear that, that you may be thinking. This is all intuitive. Think about all the parents in the room. Think about this. You want your children to know that you love them so much that they can come to you with anything, that they can come sit on your lap, unpack their day. You want to be approachable as a parent, and you want your children to know, okay, that mom and dad, they, they love me. But we also want our kids to know that their rebellion against mom and dad is not okay, and that we have a certain authority. They can't speak to us in certain ways. We want them to respect that authority. What is that? That is, we want them to have a healthy fear of us. That is good and right. And that's how we should approach the Father, God. He's Abba, Father, but we should have a healthy fear of him. And, and unfortunately, we live in a world, in a, in a society right now, where there's really even no category for being reverent to your earthly father. Fathers have been mocked and, and treated as uh, um, you know, the bottom of the the, the scum of the earth and, and when, you, when you watch movies and watch shows. Have you considered your obedience or disobedience to Christ says something about his blood? Romans 2.4, Paul says here, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Do you presume on the kindness of God? God is patient. Oh, so patient. Christ is humble. What a humble Savior. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. But we can start presuming on that and living a life where we just assume, okay, of course He's not going to discipline me. Of course he, he loves me. He, he's grace. He's got grace upon grace. And that's true to an extent. But there is consequence for how we live as Christians. Peter continues to go on in 18 through 21. And this is the, if, if you're a, a You know, if you like to to read your Bible and put things together, this is the why do we conduct ourselves with fear? This is the answer to that. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 21. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's start with the the first verse. The ways that you inherited from your forefathers were futile. That means pointless. So Peter is saying, you have inherited a pointless way of living. And what he's saying is, most of the world lives like this, and you may have been taught it. You are to live like this, how God has called you to be holy and set apart and different. And again, remember, these very Things that that were different were why these Christians were being persecuted. Because the whole Roman Empire was looking at them saying, you guys are disruptors. We have a certain way that we do things here in the Roman Empire, and you're going against them. Not too different from today. And again, we can either seek to relieve that tension, and we can say, well, I'll relieve that, and I'll go against God's word, Or we stand in the tension with salt, light, love, grace. The way in which you were ransomed was costly. 
Your, the grace that you have, the grace that I have, the grace that Vintage Faith Church has, the grace that the church all over the world has is costly grace. We aren't working for this grace, but it's costly. Bonhoeffer says in the same book, such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. So think about that. Jesus Christ says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. To follow Jesus is not hard in the sense of a, of a burden. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's joyous. It's hard in a different way. And he says, in grace, because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man and a woman, your life. To follow Jesus is to deny your life and to say, my life is his. It's costly. And it's grace because it gives a man the only true life. So in that exchange of you costing and giving your life, God is giving you more than you've ever dreamed of or known. It's the life that is truly life, the Bible calls it. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. You were bought at a price and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. The precious blood of Jesus Christ has redeemed us. We can't settle into that truth without truly settling into the truth that God is holy, we are sinful, we deserved God's wrath and justice, but we have been bought with a price. And that's grace. And that's costly grace. It's costly grace. In 1961, one of the architects um, at, a, at a German concentration camp, Adolf Eichmann, was on trial. Some of you um, older folks in the room uh, may, know, may know the name. Adolf Eichmann. He was on trial, and... There was a man who was in one of those concentration camps called Yehiel Dinur, and I'm probably not pronouncing that right. He's a, he's a camp survivor, and he was testifying against Eichmann. Eichmann was somewhere up in the ranks with the Nazis, and, and this man just terrorized Yehiel throughout his time in, in the camp. The trial is actually recorded. It was on, it was, it was televised, I, I believe. Um, but Mike Wallace, an American uh, uh, television guy, interviewed Diner, the guy that was in the camp. And apparently Diner walked into the courtroom and he saw the man that had terrorized him, Eichmann. And he fell down in tears, sobbing uncontrollably. And Wallace was interviewing him, trying to get to the bottom of, like, well, what was that? Why, why, why did you walk into the courtroom and fall down and sob uncontrollably, thinking of, okay, we can think here's the man that terrorized me. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of like, reasons that make sense, but Diner's response was this. He said, all at once, I realized Eichmann was not the godlike army officer who had sent so many to their death. He was an ordinary man. I was afraid about myself, said Diner. 
I saw that I am capable of doing exactly what he did. That is an understanding of the sinful nature. To see I could do that too. Given the right circumstances, given the right, push me in the right corner, I'm capable of that as well. I say that not to, to bring you low and to, to walk out of here like, oh, what, what, you know, Anthony's telling me that it, you know, I, I, I'm capable of murder. Well, I think Jesus would, would tell you the same thing. But I say that so you look to the cross. So you look to the precious blood of Christ and you actually can think and sing about the cross and worship where your heart bursts with worship and thankfulness for what Jesus has done. I don't understand if you don't have a category for your sinfulness how we can even worship. I, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. We're worshiping a God who took the, the penalty of death and the wrath of God that should have been on us. And oh, that's so sweet that we can get a hold of that as a church, that we can come low and be humble and realize we are nothing without him. A few questions to end this sermon. If you are looking to tangibly feel the love of God, to tangibly feel God, this is something you want to meditate on. I would just, just meditate on the holiness of God, the sinfulness of God in the cross, and you are going to feel a love from God that you can taste. You want to see the holiness of God and what your sin has done, look to the cross. You want to see the love of God and how much he loves, look to the cross. You were bought at a price. This is sobering. The waterfalls sobered me up in my 20s, but that didn't last. This is sobering. The precious blood of Christ, the true grace, the hope that is coming for us. It's sobering. Until we incline ourselves to, to these aspects of God's nature, the holiness of God, the wrath of God, the justice of God, we never appreciate the grace of God, the costly grace of God. We'll let Paul end, uh, end it here in 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have whom you have from God, you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Be holy, because God is holy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, as we ponder your words about grace and how costly the blood of Christ, how costly the grace that we have is and how the blood of Christ bought us that grace. I pray for those in here who might not like that message, who might find it strange and maybe even condemning, but I pray that they can see that it, it, it's the only true message that can free us free our consciences, our hearts. I pray that those in here who struggle to, to look to the cross and feel the love of God, that they can feel that maybe for the first time. Lord, I pray that Vintage Faith Church can be a church that takes holiness serious, that we are okay with being different from the world. Even when we're mocked and scorned, that we can stand firm in your word. We love you, Lord.
pray this all in your name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Vintage Faith Podcast. At Vintage Faith, our vision is to help people who are far from God to become totally devoted followers of Jesus. We pray that this podcast brought you closer to God. For more information, check us out at vintagefaithcicero.com.